Well, welcome to New Hope Church in Delta, BC. And if you're watching this online, we're so glad you joined us. And we are, as you can see, changing things up on the stage here. You uh, can't help but notice the incredibly back, bright backdrop that we have here. We are starting in a series called uh, The Fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. And so we are, for the next nine weeks, taking each one of the fruits of the Spirit and talking to them on Sunday morning. So we thought we'd get a backdrop painted and uh, have some fun with it a little bit. So we're getting ready to get uh, into live services within a few weeks. October 11th is what we're aiming for, all things being equal. And so when you come in here, you're going to see uh, a different kind of a backdrop and things are going to look a little different with uh, socially distanced chairs and everything. So why not do a lot of changes all at the same time? Uh, it's exciting that we are able to raise all the funds that we are looking for to uh, provide the technical support and have a camera um, and that we could uh, do this properly. And so um, we're just so blessed here at New Hope and we hope that you find this morning service an incredible blessing in your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is uh, a day that we can set aside to focus in on you, to think about you, to recognize again the love that you have for us. It's a love beyond all comprehension and it absolutely transforms and changes our life. And we thank you for that, God. May we experience this fruit of the Spirit, this love flowing into our heart and flowing out. And God, I just pray that you would meet us this morning. In your name, amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. Thank you, Jesus, that we can remain confident in you that you go before us and you fight every battle. God, I thank you that we can trust in your mighty name and that there is victory in the name of Jesus. We come to you this morning, God, and we just want to bring you all our worship, all the glory, all the honor. It belongs to you. Let's sing. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle
The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. God, we just want to be with you, to be in your presence. Would you come right now? Would your Holy Spirit meet us right where we are? We just want to be where you are, God. Surrounded by your love, wrapped in your arms. Thank you that we can find our rest in you, Jesus. Let's sing, I can't get enough. can't get enough No, I can't get enough Of your amazing love I can't get enough I can't walk away Oh, I can't walk away No, I can't walk away, for I have seen your face, for I have seen your face, and I can't walk away, I just want to be where you are, and I just want to be where you are, and I just want to be near your heart. 
There is nothing like your love Jesus, there is nothing like your love Sing, I can't get enough Oh, I can't get enough No, I can't get enough Of your amazing There's a table that you prepare for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles Let's sing that again There's a table 
There's a table that you've prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battles And I believe And I believe you've overcome me my song of praise for all you've done. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. All oh, this is how. In the valley, I know that you're with me. And surely your goodness and your mercy follow me. So my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. This is how I fight my battles, and I believe, and I believe you've overcome, and I will lift my song of praise for all you've done. This is how I fight my battles, this is how I fight my battles, this is how I fight my battles. This is how, oh, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Oh, this is how, oh, yes. Calling on your name, Jesus. Oh, by giving you our praise. Yes, it's how we fight. Oh, I'll sing. It may look like I'm surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Yeah. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, Jesus. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Sing that again. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Yes. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, Jesus. It may look like I'm surrounded. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Oh, this is how. My victory is in Jesus' name. My victory is in Jesus' name. Yes, yes. My victory is in Jesus' name. Yes. My victory is in Jesus' name. When you rose on that third day, my victory is in Jesus' name.
Well, we're beginning this new series called uh, The Fruit of the Spirit. And it is taken from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. And I'll read that for you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And for the next nine weeks, we're going to take each one of those fruits of the Spirit and we're going to uh, talk about them. And so tonight we're going to talk about love. Now, the fruit of the Spirit talks about really the idea behind it as it comes out of Galatians is the idea that there are things growing in our lives. And if we want to see good fruit happen in our lives, good character traits, these nine character traits, then we need to have that grow from the spirit inside of us. It's kind of like the plant inside of us, which grows. Or taking another illustration, you might've heard this before, but if I was to take a pop can and um, compress it, it would stay in that place. I would squeeze it, it would take less space and it would stay essentially the way it is. A rubber ball, if I took a rubber ball and squeezed it, it would change for a time But as soon as I took the pressure away, it would pop back into its original place. And the same thing with our hearts. If we really want to see our hearts change and not just pop back into place again, we can try and change things in our lives. And change is hard, but we try and take it and change it. And it kind of pops right back into uh, the spot that it was when we kind of just try and focus on, okay, I just need more love or I just need more joy. And we just try and focus in and and restrain it. As soon as our focus comes off of it, it goes back to where it was before, maybe a unloving heart or a, a, a kind of a depressed spirit rather than a joyful spirit, or instead of peace, it's chaos. Um, so we want to take a look at this and see how a, a spirit changed heart produces a truly changed life. All of us want to see change happen in our lives, but it's oftentimes very difficult. And so what, oftentimes we look at the externals and we see how can we change things on the outside and kind of go from the outside in, whereas the fruit of the spirit is something that develops from the inside out. It starts from a heart that produces that kind of uh, fruit. And it takes a heart that has the Holy Spirit living inside of it. So. Tonight, or today, I want to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and look at what a changed life looks like when it comes to the topic of love. So we're going to focus in on that. 1 Corinthians 13 is a famous passage. Uh, you, it's one of the most famous passages. You might have heard it read at weddings, and it's appropriate for weddings, but actually Paul wasn't, when he wrote these words, He was talking more about change than anything else. It wasn't just intended for a a wedding audience. It was actually intended for a group of people in a church. And this is how it goes. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. 
It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Love is an incredibly driving force in our life. It's, it's massive, and there's no shame in admitting it. Um, when we stop to think about it, much of our day kind of centers around our efforts to feel more love, to receive more love, to be all about love. We want to be caring, and we want to be cared for. We want to be known. We want to be accepted. And we want to know and accept others. And that's just what it's about. I mean, in many ways, our whole world is kind of love struck. When you look at blogs, when you look at posts, it's, uh, it's all about likes. It's all about love. Uh, we sing about love, falling in love. We read books about falling in love. We, have, we watch movies about romances. Some people might even follow celebrity kind of romances and relationships. But um, when we really look at it, the world's in love with love. In many ways, our obsession has gone off the rails. But to really change to becoming a more loving person, to really have love exhibited in our hearts, a truly changed life comes from a heart that has been touched by love. And we want to talk about that tonight. We want to talk about how this change can happen in our lives. And when we look at this, this passage in 1 Corinthians, it, um, it really helps us understand love. Love is one of the most misunderstood words in the English language. And it's maybe one of the most abused words as well. Uh, in, in Greek, they have four words, four different words for the word love. We only have one. But when we talk about agape love, which is a giving kind of a love, an unconditional kind of love, this is what it's talking about. And really this passage is saying, you know, nothing matters if, it, if we don't have love. We can live a successful life, we can live a moral life, but it doesn't matter without life, without love. A successful life and a moral life um, really isn't what it's about. If I don't have love, nothing I say will matter. The words are about love are empty. We can get really impressed with great communicators. We can get imp impressed with great speakers. And God says that doesn't impress him at all. You can be a great, great communicator and be all about the words, but if you don't have a life of love, what is it? We could have gift of prophecy is what it's talking about too in these first couple of verses. And we can know everything. We could be a walking encyclopedia <laughs> or a Wikipedia. We can be a genius and it doesn't matter. Brilliance without love equals zero. We have knowledge that in the, this world today that's exploding. And they say every few years, every six years at the most, uh, knowledge doubles. But when we look at how it's affected the world, we have terrorism, we have war, we have crime, we have prejudice and hatred and violence. Um, the world needs more love. It's not about what I know. And in fact, I can... I can have faith that moves mountains, it says here. I can have an inspirational kind of uh, abilities and talents and gifts. I can help to, to fathom all mysteries. When it talks about prophecy and miracles and revelations, it's talking about talents and gifts and abilities. I can, I can try and understand them. In fact, I can teach on them is what it's talking about here. I can be gifted in all of that. And if I don't love, nothing matters. When it talks about faith to move mountains, what it's really talking about here is a visionary faith. It's the kind that inspires people. Talents and gifts, 
filled with artistic and academic gifts and everything. Um, and so many times we can center around what it means to be active and busy. Even in church life, it can become very active. And if it's possible to have even these teaching gifts and without love, it doesn't matter. It's possible to do all of these things without love. Or love. And in fact, what Paul is talking about here is he's talking to a group of people, the Corinthian Christians, and the Corinth was a center of people moving in, smart, talented, gifted people. And yet they were filled with impatience with each other. They were oftentimes boastful. They had condescending attitudes towards one another. The whole book of 1 Corinthians is kind of addressing these kinds of things. And in fact, they were doing all sorts of things for people. But they had hurt feelings. They were cranky. (laughs) They were easily irritated. And a lot of people say, well, you know, we can overlook that. You know, that's just what, you know, what what does character really matter anyhow? If they can get the job done, if they can be successful, can you do it and be successful? We look at gifted and talented people and we look up to them. And yet, in your heart, a person can be insecure, can be prideful, and it means nothing to God. And in fact, relationships suffer. And at the end of the day, this is what, we really value too. We can actually be very successful. I mean, God can use some some good gifts and good talents to bless a lot of people and for a time, even temporarily, it can it can come out with a lot of results. But that doesn't mean that God is in it. Paul in this pa- passage moves from kind of gifts and talents and then he talks about some of the virtues. And he talks about kind of this kind of commitment. Can I, can I, can I you know, stay uh, focused on what I, if I give all I possess to the poor? Like that's a virtue. I mean, to, to go into voluntary poverty, I mean, that's a big deal. And yet he says, it doesn't matter. In, the, in another translation, it says, I could surrender my body to the flames or it says, I can give my body over to hardship a, so that I can boast. You know, this is the kind of thing where you can say, you know, I can... I can have incredible commitment. I can have a morally committed heart. I can, I can be, you know, have the kind of convictions that have the faith that, you know, I'll, I'll stand in the, against the lions. I'll stand up for my faith. And yet, even if we had all these virtues, if I don't have love, it's valueless. And he talks about a ganging, a gonging, <laughs> gong, a clanging gong, or a cymbal, a resounding gong, or a clanging cymbal. And, uh, you know, all by themselves, we know that if you just keep beating something, it can get pretty annoying. But in this context, when they did processions, when they would give honor to the gods, they would try and get the gods' attention by clanging a gong or clanging a cymbal. And uh, this was the kind of context that Paul is talking about. He's saying, we can do a lot of things to try and get God to, to do our bidding. We can do a lot of things to try and get him to do what we want. But it's not love. It's centered on ourselves. So oftentimes we can do things for others when it's really about ourselves. It's really about what we can do. And oftentimes we even try and get people to do good behavior by helping them to think about themselves. Like, how will you look like if you, if you do that wrong thing, if you're dishonest? And it's always this idea of outward in. It's just trying to change and modify behavior by looking at the outside in. And here, Paul is saying, I want you to go inside out. I want you to look at this, the signs of the spirit that is really there in you. You know, when we look at this list of things, Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's just, you know, it it doesn't rejoice in injustice, but rejoices with the truth. It never fails. I mean, this is a high standard. I know, I heard of a man who who said, I'm going to read this every day and I'm just going to focus in on this and I'm going to look at my life and I'm going to say, can I put my, my, my name in there? And he said, for the first month or so, this was the most, you know, this is a, beautiful poetic words. But he says, after a month, it became awful to me. 
because it was like, how can I, I can never love like this. You try putting your name in there. And I know I've heard that said before, you know, try putting your name in where it says love is patient. You'd say, you know, Wayne is patient, Wayne is kind. You try and put your name in there. But you do that. And I mean, if you think you're doing well, you know, you might go, oh, uh, love does not boast. Oh, okay, now I'm boasting. If, it's, if I can say, yeah, I am that. But most often, it's like, I could never do this. It becomes depressing. Um, but if you put Jesus' name there, it works. And in fact, when Paul was writing these words, there's no question that he had that in his mind. A life of love comes from the person of Jesus. Paul understood that completely. And when he wrote these words, this wonderful poetic stuff here, he was personifying. In fact, in the Greek, in the original language, it actually speaks to that. It comes through much stronger than it does in English. That it wasn't meant to be kind of just a list of attributes, um, but it was really, it's a person. And there's no question that Paul had in his mind, this is Jesus and what he did. You know, it, it doesn't, love doesn't happen by trying to do, you know, 10 things you should do kind of thing. Love is kind of a power that, that comes through you. That's why Paul, he talks about the spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us that, that changes us. And it's the, the whole idea that love, when it's received, it can be given. And it gets received through people. It isn't something that just, uh, you know, we look at a list and we say, I'm going to become that. In fact, when you look at human behavior, when you look at children, and they've done studies, and some of them, when you go and, you know, study psychology, and they've done studies where children have not been picked up or held. You know, there's been desperate times and desperate places where, where kids are left just, sit, you know, laying there in the crib. And they're not picked up, they're not talked to, they're not cooed at, they're not smiled at. And the children actually become unhealthy. And in some really dire cases, they develop diseases and die. And everybody knows, at, and that's at the worst, at the very minimum, if you never receive af affirming love as a child, you really never know how to develop as a person and how to give love to others. And so we learn love by being loved. The more our hearts are flooded with love, the more that we can do it. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And, and, the, and, and the Bible again and again talks about how God says, I'm going to leave you, Jesus says, but I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to fill your heart. He's actually he's described as a counselor, as somebody who comes into our lives and, and speaks truth into our lives speaks love into our lives. We need a powerful experience of love in order to be able to give love. And in order for it to move to another plane, it has to be an undying love. All of us know that ultimately, as human beings, we die. And so when it says love never fails, we ultimately can't look to just another human being. It's the whole idea that if we look to Jesus, we can receive love. If we just look at this list, it will crush us. We'll realize I can never do that. But if we look at Jesus, we find a God who says, I'll never fail you. He went to the cross. And when he's on the cross, he's saying, forgive them. When it says here, love keeps no record of wrongs, Jesus is on the cross forgiving all the wrongs of each person in the world. Love has to be given to be received. And when we let the love of God melt our hearts, when we truly spend time letting the love of Christ change us, the Holy Spirit by his grace comes in us and we find this fountain, this, this river coming into our lives. And we find ourselves going, you know what? When my friend is going through a rough time, needs a couch to crash on, I'll give him some time. When, a, when another friend of mine needs some grace, an inconvenience can turn into hospitality. You know, when that annoying relative <laughs> asks to borrow some more 
of something, we go, you know what? Love is saying, I'm not looking for payback. When somebody you love ends up crushing your heart, you go, you know what? I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for God. Love perseveres. Grace tells you the story, the kind of grace, the kind of love that we get from God. It tells us a story and it doesn't end there. It continues in our lives. And that's why at the end of this passage, it goes on to talk about the future. We have a love that we receive now. And it says, now we know in part. Now we see only a reflection. When it comes to love, we see it in in various kind of less than perfect forms. When our hearts center on Jesus, we see a perfect love. In this life, we're bound by the kind of definitions of love that we get through people. It's inevitable that we won't be able to completely grab hold of love. But we're looking forward to the end. And this is why he says, now I know in part, but then I will know fully, even as I'm fully known. One day, the language of love will be all that we have. It'll be all that we need. That's why it says where there are mysteries, where there are prophecies, it's going to pass away. We won't need prophecy. We won't need miraculous. We won't need revelations. It's all going to be there right in front of us. But love keeps going right through into eternity. And that's when we really see it for all, of the, all that it is. There's a story about uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Amadeus, but it showed a little bit of his character. He was a guy who tended to party a lot. He was given an incredible talent, an incredible gift, but it was insanely self-centered in his lifestyle. And there's a story about how Wolfgang... Mozart, uh, he was, as a young man, he was living with his father. And his father's name was Leopold, and his father himself was a very good musician. They lived in Vienna, and a trick he loved to play on his father when he would come home from a late night out of partying, you know, you know with, with, with friends, he would come home, and his father would already be asleep. But he'd sit down at the piano uh, on, the, on the main floor, and his father was sleeping right above it, and he would start pounding out some scales just to annoy his father, wake him up from his sleep. And then he would, he would play a scale and he would rise on the notes of the scale and then he would stop just one note short of finishing the scale. And then he would go off to sleep. And old Leopold, his father, would toss and turn in bed with this unfinished scale going on in his brain. And it would hit his dreams and his imagination. And the frustration would finally get so big because he needed resolution to the scale. Wolfgang had left it one, one note short that he would have to go down the, the, the stairs and then play the last note of the scale. I'm sure he had his ways of getting Mozart back, his son back again. But what Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 13, he's giving us a call to love. And what life itself is really an unfinished scale. And it's going ahead into God's future is what Paul's talking about here. There's going to be a destiny in heaven where the love of Jesus will ultimately flood our hearts, where the spirit power, the Holy Spirit will be fully alive in us. And all these things that we have here on earth, all the accomplishments of this earth will kind of melt away. And we'll have love. Paul says, you know, one day we're going to be fully mature adults. If you ask a person, if you were to ask me, what is a fully mature Christian? It's a person who loves. It's not necessarily somebody who has all the knowledge. It's love. When love is fully displayed, then we are we have the fruit of the spirit living in our lives. Love is kind of that catch-all overarching fruit. We're going to continue on with these fruits over the next uh, nine weeks. But one day, when it comes to love, I will be known and I will know God in a whole new way. What matters not will be my knowledge of God, but God's knowledge of me. And one day, my knowledge will be complete as well. And so Paul's saying, think within God's time plan. It's all about love. 
he's talking to a group of people and even within church, within people who are accomplishing a lot, doing lots of good deeds. They might be all, out, all about social justice, giving their money to the poor. But you can do all of that and not have love. And Paul's saying, you can be about boasting with your spiritual gifts. There was divisions in the church. There was fighting. And all these gifts are helps in this time. But love at present is an unfinished scale one day God completes the song. It's the song of love that he wants to live through us and then ultimately bring into fulfillment in the future. Let's pray. Heavenly God, I thank you so much that you have loved us so much that you would actually come and die on the cross. And when it comes to love, you demonstrated it completely. Lord, may the picture of your life and your death and your resurrection fill us with a vision of love. May it melt our hearts. May we meditate on it and think about it so that the power of the Holy Spirit can fill us, change us from the inside out. God, we're not interested in just outside kind of temporary change, surface change, but we want real change to happen in our lives. That we would truly love those around us. I thank you that that is possible through you putting your love in our hearts. In your name. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to gain he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold Sure, sure, the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. Yeah.
Well, as you go about this week, may it be about love. We know that that at the bottom line is what matters most in life. And we know who we can focus in on to receive that love. It's not something we just grit our teeth and try and will into being in our lives. We just open up our hearts. May you take time this week to really contemplate, to really look at, to really think through the kind of love that Jesus had, that he would die on the cross for yours and my sins, that he would give us the Holy Spirit to fill us with their love. May that be your prayer this week. God, just fill me with your love. May I just uh, recognize anew the kind of love that you have for me and so that I can give it to others. Have a very great week. To this